So, so I apologize. Um, and it excludes school, so this does yeah. not include school. When, per policy, when are we required to start that? At the very latest. It has to be completed by 2024, so any time between now and then, although the policy is supposed to get reviewed annually. And we, we had a similar requirement, self-imposed, last time. In, in the original. Um, so I think when Ruth says 2024, that's literally interpreting the fact that we just adopted this, but in actual fact, we've had this notion in front of us for many, many years. It, it did say that it repealed all the other ones, so I don't know if that qualifies mm -hmm. yeah. as starting today or, you know, 2018 or, or not. But. Um, and then the, um, the second question I had was um, roughly uh, for every $10,000 or $100,000, do you know what it does to, because obviously this would require some type of cash, uh, right, cash reserve. Um, what would it do to the tax rate? I'm trying to remember. The, is it is it a penny for every ten thousand bucks? I don't remember that right off the. Yeah, off the uh, it's something like that. It's something like that, yeah. So I was wondering what the net effect would be on the on the tax rate. Yeah, we, we'll convert that. I, I hesitate to give that off the top of my no. head. Um, certainly we no more than a penny. I, I don't think it would even be that much. Okay. If we use like the two hundred and forty seven thousand number, is that what you're Correct. saying there? Well, I mean or any one of the numbers is just you know, what is what is what is the impact for because one of the things that we've never really kind of shared over time is that while we set these policies, we don't really look at the impact of the tax rate of what those policies are on an annualized right. basis. Um, especially those that um, I mean, this this is about saving cash. Mm -hmm. Right. But it also would be less debt too, so it it would affect that as well. In long term, yes. To start it up, it has an impact, and then once you have the reserve, then it starts feeding it, right? Correct. Right. Yeah, there's debt service savings that need to be netted out. Mm -hmm. But it's but it, it's timely to have the conversation because it, later on in the agenda we're going to be talking about it. At least as we do the reevaluations, it looks like we're going to have a, a bump in appraised value. Right. So if we were going to do something, that would just two questions. Yeah, go ahead. So this is this is the total depreciation. Which does a depreciation sort of accommodate what the debt service would be? Probably not, right? There is. I just I just be curious about the debt service. But the other thing that stood out. It doesn't surprise me that public works is the biggest number. Mm -hmm. I was really surprised computer equipment was though. If it doesn't include the school, is that just because it's got a much shorter shelf life? So whereas the the public works is probably depreciated. Town. Townwide does include the school. The townwide computer uh, it does, does include, include the school. The school. Oh, sorry, so that's probably that's, I think that's, your point's well taken. I think depreciation on that equipment is a five, much shorter years. time frame rather than you're looking at 15 years for a plow truck. Yeah. Right. A lot of these are less than five years. And was yeah. the language specific that it was all equipment, or was there some discretion about which equipment reserves that we It could? doesn't include vehicles. Even though I keep using yeah, vehicles yeah. as an example, it does not include The equipment vehicles. reserve does not include vehicles? No. Uh, no. Well, this scenario doesn't include Oh, well, this vehicles. doesn't yeah. include the, vehicles. Yeah. Why not? I, think yeah, part my, my, I would bet that's a bigger, yeah. That's a bigger number. We, we did that, what was it, last year, the year before, and it's it was like, like in the millions. Yeah, I bet. I mean, where this all started, I think, is, you know, it, it was the million-dollar yeah. ladder truck or something that vehicles, it had. Yeah. I mean, that... That's the big item that when it hits it. I mean, we can do this for the vehicles too, so you can see yeah, what those we... two pieces are. Uh, some of the vehicles, well, maybe not. Depending on how we do it, uh, you know, the ladder truck probably would still be a bonded item, but mm -hmm. if we can get some of the smaller ones, like the pickup trucks and even the school buses out, and maybe even the plow trucks at some point in time, then, you know, those are 150000 200000 Yeah, the plow trucks tickets. are 180000 yeah. a pop. So. That would be a big savings to the bonding. Yes, yeah, so it'd be interesting to see what the vehicle does to this number. Yeah, I beg your pardon. I didn't realize that the vehicles were not in this. Mm -hmm. We can do the same exercise and add them in. Yeah, I figured do the out. Light the duty, add the light duty vehicles. I could do. Do that. you want all vehicles oh, oh, or? I think all, I think all vehicles, because even if they're bonded, they should still be included in the formula based upon the policy. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. All vehicles. That. Yeah. Hmm. I see you were taking the term equipment reserve and 
Rather simply separating out the equipment. But uh, for this exercise, we might as well understand what the bigger picture mm -hmm. looks like. We may pair back. Well, does the policy give a definition of what the equipment is? And that's why it was excluded? Um. We have the policy in here? No. I'm trying to save no. some trees. <laughs> well, I think from an account, uh, now that I think this through, I think from an accounting basis, generally speaking, on a balance sheet, the equipment is separated from vehicles. Because yeah, machinery, machinery and equipment are always separated from a on a depreciation schedule from, from your vehicles. vehicles. Yes, mm -hmm. and that's so it is separate. Along with buildings and lands are separate. I think it's still helpful to see just to mm -hmm. understand. Sure. And, and I'll categorize it for you if you want, because I think when we did it before, the number was just big way number. bigger than we thought. Oh, yeah. But yeah. I mean, the that's light lighter due to vehicles, they're like five years. Yeah. I mean, that's totally doable. I would. Imagine. I think if you could do, uh, for me, I think if you broke it down based upon the depreciated years. I can do that. So if you did like 5, 7, 10, or 5, 7, 10, yeah. and greater than. Well, it's five, and then greater than. 10 and 15 are the years. The only definition they give for capital is capital equipment. It says a major expenditure used to expand or improve a government's equipment, including vehicles, technology, and building equipment. Doesn't include vehicles. Yeah. So it's broad. Mm -hmm. All of you above. <laughs> so, um, other questions, Dalton, or any other questions? No. Um, so the question then I have is, um, with this, to move it forward, so you'll expand the analysis. Um, where do you want, uh, for the, this is for the board, uh, where do you want to place this on the agenda? I mean, how, so we brought this up. Um, do we want to ask the manager to include, now that he's, I mean, we're going to get right to the point. He's already under in his budget considerations. Do we want him to start including these type of um, policy analysis into the budget? Um, what's what's this what's this analysis going to serve as for us? I well, I, I think it. I mean, I guess my suggestion would be, however, we wanted to work as a, as a group. We'll get that number back. I think if we are serious about moving forward, we should think about. We're not going to do it all in one year, but it, I, yeah. I think this would be the year that might be a good time to start. So, yes, if I, I think maybe bringing it back here, Tom, when is... We have our next when, one next week or week after. So yeah, the quick turnaround. Yeah. yeah. You'll be it's meeting the, again we'll talk 27th, about it again. 3rd. Yeah, 23rd. And, and maybe, okay. and my suggestion is maybe then that might be a good time that we kind of give a placeholder saying, you know, start with it, a line item in the budget for it. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we know as the budget moves forward what happens in those conversations. But I think it's better starting with it in mm -hmm. the budget than trying to insert it sometime later. Um, yeah, yeah, I have think the benefit from, of the analysis, right? Right. To make a decision. Uh, and the reason why I'm kind of staging this because Tom, what I was thinking was that as part of the budget presentation is that while this can be a line item, if there are going to be other policy implications that we review as part of the budget, is to at least in the presentation separate those out so that we can see them. Um, separate from it, so it's just not melded in there, and that we can identify them mm -hmm. from an yeah, impact this will, analysis. This will be a new initiative. Right. I would certainly call it out and point yeah. it out to all of you. Because there's other policies that we've, the prior councils have done, um, that probably will have some, in, in, you know, impact. Where would you like to see it? Like under the capital budget piece themselves, or admin? Well, I, I think it should be included in whatever section as part of the regular budget present, but then just have. Here are the pieces that are embedded so that you know what it is. Um, and just because there's a couple other policies that we've talked about. Um, last year we also talked about just, um, what was it? it wasn't equipment reserve, it was capital. It was about uh, anything less, um, what was it, the capital bonding? Less than 100,000, more than 100,000. Right. That's I mean, together. which we've never really tackled, but yeah, we created the policy around that. So that would be part of this analysis. That if, if we agreed to have it in the budget, then it needs to be at least. Included in that presentation part. Yeah, I would say that it's still shown in the capital budget because you right. actually adopt a yep. general fund budget and a capital budget. It's just where's the funding coming from? Right. Yep. It all goes to affecting the tax rate. Those two things come together. Well, it's either cash or the tax rate. There, there right. is another one under the um, in the debt management section of the financial and fiscal policy it calls for reserve funds right. and reserve funds. And it talks about stuff policy. being over a million dollars. It says, over the next 10 years of the date of this policy adoption, the town will initiate a committed fund balance 
sufficient to finance 90 days of operations, which isn't really capital related, but it sounds like it's and, and operational. Where, and where are we on that? We have about 30 days. Is that where we are on where? 8.33 days. <laughs> 8. <laughs> 8. <laughs> 8. 8.33 is one month. One month, yeah. sorry. Yeah. Right. So we're about 30 days. A little days. north of that. Yeah. Right. So, that that's, so that's another one. Then the third one, Sean, I think we talked about, at least conceptually, is do we want to start funding the pension liabilities? Um, yeah. At this point in time, we know it's, it's a big nut that's hanging out there. Um, I think, Tom, and maybe, maybe it's part of the audit, I, I thought there was some conversation that at some point in time, municipalities may need to start accruing for those unfunded liabilities. So whether we want to get ahead of it or not, we've had that conversation. Yeah. We certainly have uh, financial reporting requirements now that we didn't have before yeah. on that. The so next it's a no step is likely to be uh, looking for funding of those liabilities. So we, you know, if we have, again, we'll get into it later tonight. But if if, if we have a huge increase in value, mm -hmm. um, there may be some some opportunities to start some of these practices. I do recall this in this current year, there were two things the council chose to do, uh, which will not be reoccurring expenses. You chose to fund the residential reval entirely with was that a half a million? Dollars? About three hundred thousand, as I recall, okay. and we significantly increased the overlay amount, yeah. um, anticipating um, yeah. needing to pay off that tax liability. Yeah. So together, they're about three quarters of a million dollars, as I recall, um, and that's. Largely afforded by uh, the impact of the commercial reval, um, didn't show any impact on the tax rate. But those expenses won't occur again next year. So there is some ability just in that alone to to fund additional things without showing upward pressure to the tax rate. Um, I would re remind you, though, many commercial taxpayers were wondering why there wasn't a, a reduction in the tax rate this year. Mm -hmm. So that's the consequence. Of course. Yeah. That's balance. Yep. Yep. I think when we move to the next agenda item, yeah, we'll so see we move, some of that, yeah. uh, those decision points. So if there's no other questions, we'll move on to B, which is financial modeling. Yay. Yeah, this is Larissa's. Uh, so she was. Larissa, I need to report, uh, has, has broken her leg over the weekend. Um, she anticipates being back in action as soon as tomorrow. I, I'll see about that. But uh, this is the, what's in front of you, this is really entirely her work. I know she's drawn upon Ruth's experience and, and others, but um, I'll do my best to walk you through it. Uh, the feedback we received last time was to be kind of uh, more 30,000 foot or a higher, higher focus. She chose to use this format that we've used for the tax rate comp sheet as a method of reporting. There's nothing magical about it, but it's intended to be a familiar format that's fairly easy to follow, and it kind of reports the big chunks, if you will, not the minutia. Um, she did provide on the back side, if you haven't seen it, uh, kind of just notes and footnotes to explain the sort of assumptions she's made. And I know I'll speak for her in that uh, we're wide open for suggestions whether the assumptions we made were right. Uh, we can modify them, but we need to start somewhere. So in big picture, for both expenditures and revenues, she's carried forward the, la the average of the last three years as a percentage uh, for, for purposes of kind of growing both revenues and expenditures. Those are debatable whether that's a reasonable assumption to use. Um, and then she's gone further and modified, particularly on the revenue side. Um, and she's called out three different things that she's factored in here. Uh, First one is a, a, a change in uh, state revenue sharing. Currently, it's at 2%. State law has it. Uh, it's supposed to be funded at 5%. Mm -hmm. She's assuming growing at 1% over the next three years. 1% a year? 1% or 1 a year for the next three years. Um, it may be that we move entirely to 5% in this year. We don't know. That's some of the discussion in Augusta. That's in Sean's hands, right? It is. Yeah, can, but, can you back up? It's, um, only because I was just getting acronym. So she's saying 1% a year, but yet she shows in the model that next year it would be an, a decrease of minus 2, the year after that only a positive plus 1. Is that the net? That's the valuation, right? The, the tax of the property valuation. Mill rate. Yes, yeah, mill rate. So that's, you're way downstream from me. I'm, uh, uh, that's taking into consideration uh, all expenditures. Are talking about the total dollars then? This is the tax rate calculation yeah. model that you're 
focused yeah. on. But I'm even looking at the I mean even looking at the spread and I don't see an increase of one percent. It shows it's an increase it's, of uh, it's built into that. As a base, she's used the three year average to grow both the revenues and okay. expenditures. She's modified the revenues in three ways, and I've just started to talk about the first way. Okay. So um, three year average. And that's shown that on one A on the back. So for state revenue sharing, she's grown it an additional 1% for each of the three years that we're looking forward. For state aid education, she's made some adjustments for additional um, special edu education monies coming. And this is done based on input from uh, Kate Bolton and Julie. And then on She's actually lowered her uh, estimates for non-property tax uh, revenue. Those are more based on general economic condition and, and such. So she's been a bit conservative in that regard. Has she modeled Scarrow Downs, the CEA now? She hasn't. She's kind of called that out in this paragraph down here. That's, that's a, a big issue that we need to yeah. understand going forward. We don't need space it having much of any effect in this next fiscal year upcoming right but in two and three years out we we think it will so uh, we just don't have clarity in that regard that's something that's going to be looked at very closely okay. yeah, their cash flow model had said no nothing positive till year three right but it's going to affect our budget in terms of uh we're gonna have to fund the credit enhancement agreement uh, so year, in year two this is front of mind for us and we're gonna have to be watching it very carefully and, and projecting it out. So she's flagging it as an issue that's going to have to be worked in. Carefully, that might affect yeah. these numbers. Carefully looked at. It's good to know from this view that it's... Well, yeah, it's actually... The, it says um, we can expect value to continue by adding fiscal year 21 and 22. Coming to Beacon Ag... Oh, okay. Might. Yeah, remember, we actually uh, characterize credit enhancement agreement payments. So anything we've agreed to reimburse through a credit enhancement agreement as an expense, which it is. So we'll also we'll book the revenue mm -hmm. as taxes paid, which it is, and then we book, book an expense going yeah. back out. Yeah. Um, so we'll be watching very carefully just because the order of magnitude is significant here. The other ones um, aren't, aren't quite as right. notable. From a capital point of view, um, she's... Uh, She's actually looked at the five-year capital plan and, and, and included those costs going forward. She has made an assumption that uh, we'll be financing about $4 million a year, which is slightly less than the last three years of average. And that's done with the notion that we're going to start to find other ways to fund these projects rather than through uh, long-term debt. Tom, didn't the yes. four million? Didn't we kind of target that in some of our conversations with the finance committee? Mm -hmm. That that was the number we were. Yeah, we modeled two, four, and six. Yeah. four yeah. is kind of the historical average, uh, yes. up and down around it. Yeah. Uh, so I think it's a reasonable assumption for this purpose. Purpose. Uh, she's also chosen to bump up the overlay significantly in FY 2020, um, up to five hundred thousand, and that's really based on the fact that we've got a reval and, and there could well be abatements that are paid out as a result of that. That's a fairly common occurrence. So if you look at that line of overlay, it's down here in the sheet. Um, second one down, it's 500,000 in 2020, and then she's dropped it down to historical levels of 175 for those out years, which is what the normal amounts are. And what is that? Uh the That's the amount of money that uh, ends up being returned to taxpayers because one reason or another, mistakes or otherwise, we have overvalued their property and need to abate certain value. Um, so, um, with the, uh, I, I don't disagree with the uh, standard of how any of the measures are set mm -hmm. based on averages and things. That makes complete sense. Um, the question I have is that from a planning perspective, um, is it the expectation of the board um, that we will, from year to year, change those uh, definitions of expectation? The reason why I'm asking is that, um, so like with this particular, uh, in the overlay category, even though it's nominal considering the size of the budget, um, this past year we only did an overlay of $350,000 for a much larger revaluation of the commercial side, right, Three fifty. Uh, uh, well, it's commingled. The, the total overlay is something closer to eight hundred thousand. 
but that's our method to fund this tax liability for the Preds Neck Appeals as well. Uh, we think the exposure just... left is in the order of four hundred thousand dollars or so. Well, we don't know exactly. About that tax abatement, yeah. um, so that, that but in. but to, yeah. to take four hundred off, it's it's between three hundred three yeah. and four hundred thousand yeah. for the commercial. Now there's only nine hundred accounts as opposed to well, that's why I was yeah. eight thousand accounts, and mm -hmm. our tax base is three hundred billion of which is residential. So seventy five percent of our tax base is wrapped up in the residential mm -hmm. side. And as you're speaking of that, though, Tom, what? So if, if I read this right, between 2019 and 2020, mm -hmm. there's going to be a $500 million jump in valuation. Is that the reval? Is it is, and, and she's... That's just the residential She's reval. provided a rationale here. Um, 80 uh, uh, on average, residential properties are valued about 80% of value at this point. She hasn't pulled them all the way to 100. She's pulled them to 95% of value. So it's a 15% increase except for waterfront is trending closer to 88 percent and so it, she's she's calculated waterfront properties at 88 percent so she's been fairly exact about uh, what the potential uh, increase in value is uh, as a result of the reveal process it's going to flip people out there when they get there yeah. okay well and yeah. the rule of thumb is a third go up a third stay the same a third go down uh, so not a, not everyone will be affected equally obviously that's the purpose of the exercise. It's to get everyone on the same scale. But overall, it's five hundred million, which, which you know, for the, for those that go down, is a, so anyway. Just something to think about as we go through the budget process and right. things. And so, not surprisingly, what you see in the bottom, which takes into account the valuation uh, in cal calculation, calculating the uh, expected tax rate, we see a, a decrease of two percent of the tax rate as a consequence of that. Mm -hmm. Um, and then a slight rise um, in the in the future years. And I think that's the exercise. It's really understanding some of the mechanics, uh, but anticipating what those effects will have on the tax rate going forward so it can be manageable, predictable, sustainable. Yeah, so two comments that to cater to your point. Um, I, don't, I don't want to call anybody out, but my neighbor just sold our house in four days, being on the market for eighty thousand dollars more than what the tax rate is, mm -hmm. and, sure. it's, and it's a split branch on yeah. the quarter acre oh, property. Sure. Yeah. So I don't disagree with the estimates um, that are made and the theory behind it. The concern I have, which is, and this is the only concern with forecasting I have, is really that total valuation. Is that um, at what point do you start um, trying to forecast economic downturn um, or some type of you know uh, recessionary impact of valuations? Because you will have a correction, an overstatement, which could be sooner than later. Yeah, the only thing I can Probably say not that, the time frame that we're looking at here, um, but it's going to be darn close. To our great surprise, our values did not go down much at all during this right. last recession, two thousand eight. They actually nine. increased not as much as they had in the past. Like we used to get sixty million every year. I think we were doing like fifty yeah, million. Yeah, which really bucks the trend. Almost the rest of the state, everyone mm -hmm. went down. We were, I won't say recession proof. Your point's well taken, but all I can look to is recent history, which was arguably some of the worst economic downturn we could expect going forward, I hope, knock on wood. Uh, and, and we fared fairly well there. So our, our rate of increase year over year is going to slow down, but I don't expect we'll go backward. And it, and it hurt, I mean, it does slow down. Um, it's a little, I think in year 2022, it's a little bit hefty of a jump, almost 50. Yeah, that could be okay, 50 million, but... Um, yeah. The other thing coming online for this upcoming fiscal year is the Beacon Apartments. Last yeah. April 1st, right. they were, I don't think they were even out of the ground. Mm -hmm. Now they have at least eight buildings on the roof, and by this coming April, they're likely to be f not 100%, but um, pretty close to full value. So that project alone is probably a $25 million value um, that we'll pick up for the first time. How many times? I'm one? guessing $25 million or so. Thank you. I tell you, they're brilliant markers. That, not that I'm sophisticated. Go ahead. No, no, go ahead. I was going to say, not that I'm sophisticated, but a little bit that I've been on Facebook. Every time on Facebook, I get pinged with an ad for Do you? for their apartments, luxury apartments. Yeah, I have to check in. I don't visit. know how they're doing with uh, rent, with rentals. Um, they continue to build on a breakneck pace. And they've been uh, 
they have such an aggressive build, build schedule. They are actually buying bulk materials uh, on, on the futures market. They were taking orders, taking them on site, you know, months and months and months before they ever needed them, which is a, usually a cardinal sin. The demand of wood right now and they did, else. yeah. They're trying it's to hedge their bets. Such a backlog because uh, all of the wood is coming from out of country. They typically don't order until they need it, so they don't have to, yeah. to the, the pay, store it or delivery, pay for it. Order but, and delivery is huge. They were trying to hedge their bets against uh, these increases in material costs. Yeah, but if they didn't have 80 percent, I mean, most banks wouldn't provide funding unless they were 80 percent occupied at each one of their phases, generally speaking. So I just I just throw that out there. That's a unique thing that's going to really uh, it will be different in our annual calculation. We'll still have general appreciation. We we have fairly robust economy elsewhere in town, and that's just a kind of an anomaly. Yeah. So, so I think to answer your question about, yeah, I think this is just, as we had said, a rough living, breaking document that we will update or should update as we go along. I think what we were trying to do is see if we could get there. And then, too, I thought what we were trying to use it for is try to pick places where it might make sense to make those investments and spread those investments out mm -hmm. to areas. So yeah, if it's going to be negative 2% next year, that may be a place so I think that was a thought, just try it as we mm -hmm. look at the schools coming online, and that's still, what, a 60 to $100 million project that's for the primary schools, if that's, if that's the way they go. Well, and yeah. yeah, so um, what I want would like to see is that, so tying this back to A um, and the other pieces is that what is the impact of these, um, the impact mm -hmm. analysis with these policy changes, because that 2% is going to get swallowed up really fast Yeah. Yeah. No. yeah. Um, with the depreciation reserves and yeah. the, and you may not choose to do them all at once, uh, as you right, say. I think this is a way of phasing, them in. phasing in, understanding when's the opportunity in the future. Do you, do you like the format? Yeah, I did. I, did. Um, I think this could be refined further, and I'm sure I didn't do the introduction <coughs> justice, so the rest will probably want to backtrack a bit on it. But um, and I think for me the goal with, with this was, so you have the benchmark, um, the dashboard, is that this would become part of that dashboard when we start reviewing the budget um, as part of the whole analysis package. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and one thing I'd ask is the sort of a practice that we build in is to get to Sean's point, this, you know, we're going to have to adjust this as we go along. But one thing that might be helpful is at the end of the year, compare what this said to where we ended up and then adjust you know, if we made some, we can tweak those adjustments, assumptions as we go along. Actual versus plan. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So we, we kind of, it's a learning document that, you know, we don't expect it to be spot on. Yep. It's directional. But each year we should be able to learn from it and kind of modify it. So as we go along, we're continually improving sort of the, the modeling process. And we learn what I think I've heard you say that. Continuous improvement. It's continuous improvement. Yeah, and, that's right. and we learn which, which items need to be tweaked a little bit in terms of our estimates. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. What do we totally miss? How how accurate mm, were yeah. we? And Sean, we included these at your request. These yes. uh, these were just uh, kind of I'll say independent indicators of our financial health and out, and, and outlook. Um, yeah. So and the reason why I did that. So these are both from uh, Moody's and also from uh, S and P Global, uh, which are the two credit agencies. Because one of the things, uh, of course, we always look at credit rating and what is the impact of all of our decisions related to that, um, because that impacts bonding, um, particularly at a time with rising interest rates, bonding, future bonding is going to be a significant issue that we need to consider and what the cost impact in the current market. Um, the second piece is that, um, so as we talk about A and all those reserve funds, what I would like to understand is um, by implementing those, what does it do to any one of these agencies? Oh, yeah. So if... Um, I can't remember his name, our bond agent um, could give us an opinion on, you know, if we implement those policies, does it improve um, any one of these positions? Um, and the irony of the two agencies is that generally speaking, and it could be a mixture of, of everything, is that um, one will improve, the other one will say no, because, you know, one is uh, reserve dependent, the other one is um, asset dependent um, or um, um, valuation dependent and, and debt. When one likes debt, one doesn't like debt. So it's always this balance and which one do you want to manage to? I suspect they would view favorably the three that we talked about. Right. Um, and I say that from sitting in on past rating calls. Uh, you know, our debt burden um, is 
is something they all flag, they both flag in terms of something just to watch. Um, fund balances we know is a huge issue. We can never have enough for them. And funding future liabilities is always something they want to see us do. What I can't tell you, and Joe maybe can't either, is whether if we do all of those, even all three, whether it actually shows an increase. Um, well, moving upward in that bond rating is exceedingly difficult. It's really holding the very good position we're in. We were AAA at one time. I don't know when that was, right? Somebody said that. Somebody said, were we ever um, when, when we, back in the day, they used to do bond insurance. And uh, when you purchased that insurance for that bond, it, it essentially made it a AAA. But I don't think we were actually ever. I see. The rating really itself was not AAA. Yeah. I see. Yeah. For the bond issuance, it was not AAA, but after you insured the bond, after it became AAA. It becomes AAA, but yep. then they stopped doing bond insurance. So. Right. You know, and, and I guess the reason why is that, um, you know, how do I say this? Um, at some point, we need to recognize that we may not be able to get a higher rating because we're either too right. small of a town um, and um, or, you know, the construct, the construct of our budget doesn't simply allow it. And, you know, where is that? As long as we don't deteriorate, right. you know, That's we need the, to kind of, it's, it's about sustainability. Um, and not necessarily about growth or and, improvement. And even if we do go up, as I recall, Joe said, uh, moving up one more notch on the ladder, I think saves us 10 basis points. It wasn't, wasn't, and so it's, it's a trade-off. Is, uh, is it worth it? Um, I think my focus really is about maintaining the good credit we have and, and not slipping. Well, and if our focus is going to be debt reduction, it doesn't help us getting a higher rating because we're not yeah. borrowing. Right. The, Sorry. Okay. The one thing that, that I noticed is, I think it was in the Moody's one where it said, or I was just looking at this online, is that we are at the, the fourth position in terms of investment grade. So we do we yeah. drop out of investment grade status if we go lower than that? If we if our bond if, rating drops, yeah. Yeah. So, so that that would be yeah. a key yeah. line not to cross. Yeah, and just to put these two in perspective, um, Moody's, I think for the first time this year, to my knowledge, just did this. This is something they do, uh, they issued in early December, just kind of a year-end. Uh, whereas S&P, this was actually the, the rating um, that they gave us last spring for our last bond issue. So uh, that's the best we had from that agency. But it covers the same general territory. I mean, for me, the, the piece that stood out for me, which I think is echoes what you're saying, Don, is the S&P and their sort of downside on page five. I mean, they really talk about that, you know. And I think, Sean, you're the one that's really led us to increasing those reserves upward. We keep building on them. But the real caution here is as we look at the budgets and do things to make sure we're not going to decrease the reserves. And, that and I think like. the equipment reserve fund, or the reserve fund that talked about in the debt management portion of the policy uh, talks about increasing our committed fund balance mm -hmm. if you will and that goes to help total fund balance mm -hmm. so you know I think that will help things I think the only time the town got a downgrade was back in 2009 or 10 when we um, went below our policy and stayed there for two years the two or three years, I can't remember. They gave us, they gave, kept the rating, but they gave us a, a negative a outlook watch. or a yeah. cautious outlook. Cautious, yeah. Because mm -hmm. um, you can go below whatever your stated policy is as long as you have a plan to get back. I've always remembered that mm -hmm. yeah, from, the, from we, those rating calls. We yeah. had a plan, and we told yeah. them we had a plan. Yeah. And the council very consciously did that in yeah. fiscal year 2009. They said, we do not want to be part of the problem. And yeah. so they um, used a little bit. A lot of fun battles to make sure there was no tax rate increase. You know, the secondary part to this conversation is that it's further down the road, it's way further down the road. It's really, it's after these type of financial analyses are done, which is all wonderful, is to then start, when do we start focusing on the qualitative aspects of the programs that we have? Um, because future investments in those, um, you know, we have to, you know, are we happy with just saying at level services or at level value? Um, and when do, especially in a growing community, when do we start investing more? Um, yeah, I think the time's come that we should probably think about doing a comprehensive ad attitudinal or customer uh, yep. satisfaction survey to make sure that the type and the level of services uh, we provide are what our residents want. Uh, we don't have a good feedback loop right now to, to answer that question. Um, it's easy to say, well, they're not complaining, so I guess they like it. But, you know, we don't have any empirical data to support that. So that's probably the next piece to answer that goal. Right. Yeah. 
So well, and if it can be um, also focused in the sense that, because I know that, um, I think it was, was it Yarmouth that might have been, because I have a copy of it. Yarmouth did a attitudinal survey, but it was around more about aging in place and what type of services could be generated or what type of services did they, did they want to support aging in place um, and how, you know, so you can kind of compartmentalize those. The issue is going to be, do, do we have the in-house staff to do that or are we going to have to outsource that? Probably outsource it given the size of the community. And to do it right, uh, yeah. a good deep dive uh, probably does require some outsourcing. And then how much is that going to At least in, in uh, deriving the survey questions. Plus there needs to be some, some way you weave into that. I mean, everybody says they love all the services until they have to do trade-offs. Mm -hmm. right? What do you want no. more of and less of? And that's how you tease that out and be the, the real value. If we had to make choices, which at some point we will. It'd be great to try if, you know, we, if and when we get to that point of picking a service and, you know, which, uh, which one to use. It's someone that has, it's, you know, that's recognized and would allow some benchmarking or, you know, have some database that we, you know, helpful. So I don't have any names off the top of my head. Mm -hmm. Probably Jim Demesis would know the source. Yeah, he's been connected. He's been connected to that data and mining. And we've done them in the past, so we could look back to who we used. I think we had a, actually GFOA helped GFOA. us do one last time. Yep. Great. Um, moving on to uh, C, but under the budget process and schedule for neighborhood budget outreach. Um, just, you know, I did reach out to um, Sarah Layden, who is the school board's finance chair. I um, have had a preliminary, preliminary conversation with her. She said she was going to try to be here. Um, um, they had their meeting, uh, finance meeting, uh, last Monday. I haven't had a chance to talk to her since then. But um, generally speaking, they were um, very much in favor of continuing having joint um, committee meetings with us That's great. Uh, through the budget process. Um, so we'll need to take a look at that as well. I did mention to her... Um, the schedule for the budget and kind of explain how the, the schedule is set, that it's not the joint committee that sets it, it's the town council that sets that budget. Um, and I also did mention to her the opportunity to maybe this year move the school's presentation um, of their budget to the top of the schedule rather than to the bottom. Um, and we can go over that because that's in one of the diagrams I can't, that's in the, yeah, the, the, the actual calendar. Yep. So we'll talk about that as well. But. We had some just some rough conversations about how we can move forward, and um, they seemed very open um, to mm -hmm. that. Tom, do you want to cover? Well, she did uh, actually propose a couple of dates, I think, for the joint meetings. Uh, February 11th would be the first. And, John, I'm reading off what you yeah. forwarded me earlier. And then she's also looking at March 13. So I wonder if this group could identify whether you're available and willing to meet on those dates. That would be for the joint finance committees. Which which dates are those, Tom? January 11th. February 11th and March 13th. Monday and Wednesday. February 11th, I'm open. March 13th, I'm pretty certain. It's since it's a Wednesday. Yeah, I'm open on the 11th as well. Mark, and both days, I'm open. Is staff available? Be, yep. I, with that much well, notice, that we'll. I think both work. Well, I think it's important for everyone to get those dates on their calendar, just so yeah. we're committed. Uh, beyond that, there does seem to be interest in this budget, uh, neighborhood budget outreach effort. Um, details to be sorted through, but conceptually, I think they seem willing. So, Don, I think you were part, at least as a citizen, you were part of those. So that's for the, for the tape and for the people. Um, that was the partnerships that we had between a council member and a school board member with a designated staff member having an... Um, um, a, a, a small forum in different locations throughout the town. I think that we could do that again. And, and that's separate from what the manager right. and the superintendent have on their listen and learn tour, um, which is already underway um, as they develop the budget. So I think, I think that would be um, a, a great approach. I don't think the entire council did it. I know that the, definitely the three uh, finance so, uh, members did. Seven, yeah. The chairman did too, I yeah, think. We'll do it in, uh, Katie did. I, yeah, I think yeah. we all had signed up. I think we ended yeah. up. Well, I think we ended up not doing them all for some reason. I can't remember why. Yeah, we scheduled seven. So every member seven, in council. But, but I think something happened. So we. I think it. So that's, that's a discussion point. Whether yeah. that was too much, uh, but. 
I would think four or five might be appropriate. Would you be able to, by the 23rd, come back and tell us what, um, which ones didn't happen last year? Sure. And then, you know, we can adjust, but maybe set up a, a generic grid of uh, let's, let's pair people, you know? And I think that um, uh, without any other suggestion, you know, if um, uh, Leanne and Peter, maybe one team, <coughs> another two chairs, and then Sarah and I being chair of finances and then other combinations, I think would be, I think we kind of did that before. We yeah. have a respectful approach. Yeah, and that happens, uh, it, last year it happened April into early May. It was yeah. after the budget was proposed, yeah. but before adopted. So right. it's your opportunity to get input before you decide. If you can do me a favor, whatever day you sign me up for, it cannot be Tuesday or Thursday. Okay. Well, I'll sign you up. Uh, we'll identify yeah. a schedule. Okay. Where, <laughs> and, uh, people can sign I up kind for of the benefits. It, it, yeah. Um, day or even, uh, evening is a little, it might be able to do it on the evening, depends on, on how late in the season it is with the legislature. We tried to mix up location and time of day too, just okay. to see if yeah. we could reach yeah. out to as many well, I thought they went very well. And pretty well attended. There was 15 to 20 in most of them. Yeah. A lot of duplicate, kind of like the form that we had before, but still worth it. Yeah. Still worth it. Um, and then, um, so um, you, get, you get the full calendar. Um, that Tom has given, which is um, takes us all the way through June. Um, Tom and Kate had worked on this. Basically, the overview that I understand is that most of this is prescribed by charter. As far as the date that we have to approve it by, um, the submission dates and things are all prescribed based what you know as far as when the manager submits it to the town. One thing that we did do last year that I thought went very well is that Tom was able to present the budget. Um, Early and then um, we did not take up first reading until I think the next meeting. We've done this. You've done the same right. in this. Yeah, we as well. The same. I think that worked. I think that worked. Um, and going into the um, the budget adoption schedule, um, which is more about our time, um, we normally have five days or five days, including the final recommendations from the committee. Um, I wanted to recommend that we consolidate that um, first. Is um, in speaking with the schools, and I believe um, Kate is capable in this. Uh, finance director on their side, would like to move the schools to the very beginning and um, have them on day one, which would be April 9th, um, you know, for the full hour that they have. Mm -hmm. So they would take up from six to seven. Yeah, that's good to do. And then reallocate, in essence, reallocate downward. Sure. Now the question I have for, the, for, the, for us is, um, do we really want to sit down with every department and have that half an hour, 30 minute presentation um, that um, or do we want to take a different approach? And the challenge in, in this conversation, um, without pointing fingers, but um, Don's being the new guy, because there is an advantage. No, there is an advantage. And by the way, if you weren't part of it, I remember a time when we literally had that book. Every you remember the every single line item was um, debated on, and why is this a thousand percent increase? And it's a counting change, and um, and then we've kind of moved away from that. The question is, do we want to do that? Um, is there an opportunity to consolidate and, and maybe say, um, because of the size of their budget, it's not necessary to have a half an hour conversation? There's a couple that I can think of. Um, but I also, and, 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 you know, uh, all fairness, um, there are some departments that love coming and giving their presentation, and there are some that don't. Um, not to pick and choose, because I think we have to treat them all fairly, is um, I think we need to do what we think is best for our conversation and, and manage around that. So... You know, open it up to what, what would you guys like to do? First of all, are you okay moving the schools to the oh, front? Absolutely. Because yeah. we've been talking about that for a couple of years, and it was always based on timeline, very yeah. difficult. Yeah, sure. We'll do it. Um, okay. And then after that, um, you know, I would like to at least consolidate it into four, if not, um, sorry, into three, uh, because I don't consider that final recommendation piece really part of it. So it's really from four to three. On your point about the yeah. detail, you know, the, I, I go back and forth on this. I mean, I'm, uh, uh, you know, not infinitely detail-oriented, but I think there is some value in, in looking at the detail, the supporting detail. What, what I find it happens is not every department, like you said, not, not every department uh, finds this easy to do or likes mm -hmm. doing it. But I, I think that cause of change discussion and trying to highlight what, ha what happened last year, pluses and minuses and what's going to, you know, what they're predicting and why. Uh, there needs to be enough detail there that we can respond to that and be able to refer to supporting supporting details. So I don't know what, how that differs, you know, from last year, but I know 
I, I understand the reason of moving away from infinite detail. It tends to bog things down and you lose the forest for the trees. But I think each department should have the ability to say, hey, here's, you know, here's what happened and why, and here's what we're looking for next mm -hmm. year, and these are the key issues. And then there's a Q&A on top of that. Um, so it's um, whatever process we want to take, it's open. Yeah. So whatever we'd like to take. Because we also have Paul, who's new. So I want to give an opportunity. You know, personally, I was thinking um, to do something different is that we could have um, an opportunity, anybody including existing you know, long-term counselors, if you have questions, let's prepare them in advance, get them to staff so they can answer, um, make sure that we provide to the public as part of our, you know, yeah. um, on that budget portal, here are all the questions, yeah. and here are the answers to those questions, yeah. um, and, you know, um, and maybe kind of approach it from that perspective. Yeah. And then what we do as part of our recommendations is have a conversation about anything that you might um, want to either increase, decrease, or you have an issue with. Um, with the exception of the schools understanding that we're forbidden or by law yeah. to do a line item um, other than the total amount of their budget. I mean, I'm open. I just I want to make it as efficient as possible um, and um, worthwhile because we've come a long way from where we were, mm -hmm. and I'd like to see us move a little bit more. I think we're almost there to a really, really perfect process, but so I'm open. Uh, yeah, whatever I, you guys. I think we've hit, uh, you know, um, both ends of the spectrum. We had the used to have the big forum, yeah. right? Um, and then that was superseded by the you know the neighborhood meetings or whatever those the ones where the council uh, members are attended. So, uh, but I think and I heard, I've heard people complain about losing the opportunity to you know to ask questions uh, uh, in a larger forum. I mean, if there's and I, I think that, uh, that on the one hand, on the other hand, the you know, you want to give the departments a fair chance to respond. But I felt from some of the neighborhood meetings there were really good questions that didn't get uh, recorded carefully and were, were never really kind of never answered. So I felt that that led to just sort of a rolling uh, buzz, you know, tending negative about the process. So I, you know, I just want to make sure we have a beginning and end to when questions are raised that there is a, you know, there is an outcome. I captured some. Yeah. Yeah, and a running record of that. Uh, so, so it's so Tom. I have to ask: Is I mean, you're the one that got the feedback. Is that new? Is that opinion new to you? As far as yeah, we, questions we, not being. We answered? tried to have a scribe at all of those and record and and uh, and post online uh, written responses. So um, I'll have to follow up on that. We but really, I remember in the past. I mean, I, and I read these. You know, my wife wrote a lot of them. <laughs> uh, so <laughs> well, the answers to the questions, but. It, you know, we were very detailed. Some of them were very detailed and lengthy re responses. But I remember we we lost some of the granularity, and I, I think in, in, uh, because of that, uh, you know, maybe we didn't have quite the momentum, uh, the positive momentum that we could have otherwise. So I mean, I'm doing this really as a, as a process issue, not as a, you know. I think everyone yep. is striving to do the best job they can. And uh, I think you're right. When we did the budget forum, we had. Uh, more time and better control of the questions coming in before we recorded them at the time, and I think it was a more elaborate and detailed set of responses. Whereas this is kind of the shotgun approach: we're yeah. seven different places with fourteen different individuals running them, and yeah. so I'm sure there's something lost uh, yeah. by way of process and approach. So some some place in the medium, uh, medium, you know, mm -hmm. in the middle of that, I think would be yeah. would be a good. Way so maybe to between because. Um, um, how do I say this the right way? So every one of our town council finance committee meetings, we have public comment, which was started only a couple years ago, um, other than um, Mr. Hanley being a regular um, and uh, yourself when you were. Um, we get very, uh, very rare do we have any participation um, or any questions that get posed. Um, every one of those meetings are advertised, in which I can tell you that other than Mr. Hanley and Ms. Hamill and yourself, um, very rarely did we ever get questions regarding the budget. Um, and so I, I just question, um, at what point do we stop changing for the sake of changing and simply understand that participation is going to be a little lower? I'm not saying, I mean, by the way, I'm not saying don't answer the questions. I'm just saying is that how do we incorporate more than what we're doing now already to ask for participation in which we're not getting it? Um, so... It, it, it's, it's a tough balance. You know, uh, you, people are probably familiar. There's you know, this role now called a scribe, you know, a 
who uh, in a medical setting, it's the doctor yeah. who doesn't have his nose in the, the PC anymore. You have a scribe taking down notes and the doctor tries to pay attention to the patient. I mean, something like that, I think if we had someone who was really, really good at it and we had one, you know, one note taker, I mean, this is a horrible thing to think about one person doing all that. It's going to be enormous. But if there was some way to kind of have mm -hmm. consistency with that, so you had one author and one voice, uh, that might help. I don't know. Wasn't that what? Yeah. Like, wasn't Larissa kind of setting? She was, and she was a, I think she was a scribe at all yeah. of those, frankly. Right. Um, again, the differences between the budget forum and this more informal setting, and, and I think there's pros and cons of each, is that there was great formality and regularity of the budget yeah. forum where if someone had to, you know, mm -hmm. state the question and we did our best to answer it on the spot and then we followed up with more detailed written responses. Something had lost in that formality, and so we tried to go the other way by having more decentralized conversations. And so, you know, yeah. it's yeah. It, I'm not sure how to satisfy um, both. I think more meetings you have, the more meetings you have, the less likely it is to have a critical mass, or it varies. You know, we have bad weather, or who knows what. Mm. You know, um, so I don't really know. Uh, yeah, in, in my observation, I participated in a number of those uh, budget outreach meetings and. You did as well. Uh, they were more conversational. They they often weren't yeah. uh, didn't start with a question. They were yeah. more a comment, and yeah. you know it kind of yeah. uh, was organic. And so I, I think because of that, we lost a little of that detail of question answer. Well, well, and it's because how can you answer a question if you're just hearing it for the first time? Yeah. Because sometimes the level of the granularity Real that's time, expected right? is time. Some of these analysis, some of these Research. questions requires. I mean, you and I had talked about. Yeah. The time that you two have taken to answer some of those questions is a little bit beyond what is normally expected. So, um, getting that information in advance, you know, otherwise you're in this gotcha kind of situation, you know, which no one wants to be in. It's not really, I don't think that's intended by anybody either. Yeah, I'm not, I would not attribute our success in getting the budget passed first time last year because of this change of process. Oh, gotcha. But it may have played a role that it was, uh, we connected with more people at a different level. Yeah. The Roger. lasting record of those conversations was probably lacking. Yeah. Can we take those? Are those tapable meetings, sessions? Uh, they can be. They're often in different locations, yeah. so that adds just a logistical challenge to it. Yeah. I mean, I don't want to add more work, but I think what the other thing that tends to happen in these meetings is where uh, I know this happened in the big community voice meeting they had at Camp Catcher, but they, you know, you, you gather everything, and then there are things that emerge, you know, the themes that emerge, and then you drill on those. So. I mean, uh, again, it's uh, you know I don't want to turn this into a chicken dinner, but you know it's that's you know. So I mean, I, I mean, I think for me, Sean, on this piece, which is around these meetings, mm -hmm. I don't know if it's possible. I know, yeah, we ran into that last year, but I, my suggestion, at least when I review the book, and when are we going to get sort of the final? How far in advance will we get sort of the final budget book before these are scheduled? My my point is. When I go through the budget, there, there, lots of times there are just several departments that are like just pretty clear cut. The information's really good. You don't really need mm -hmm. to spend time. Every now and then, there are departments that have something unique going on. I don't know if we can keep these blocks of time, but then just make a call saying, "Geez, we don't." You know, if you look at this and say, "Geez, we don't need to look at administration on Tuesday night," and if there's some flexibility in top staff. I mean, we may be able to eliminate a lot of the departments and just focus on ones that really have something significant mm -hmm. going on we want to understand. Well, and yeah. we, may be able to cut, we may be able to cut this time way back, but then it was up to Tom. We got to that point mm -hmm. last year where then we said, but, geez, some of the people really want to come and talk to us. So I, I don't know what we, how we balance that, but I think there is an opportunity. My guess is on here. There are some that are going to be pretty clean. Oh, absolutely. Um, so what I was going to suggest is, um, rather than us going through the possible combinations other than school being first from 6 to 7 mm -hmm. on the 9th, if every one of these can utilize the time right up until 8, and Tom, if you can make a recommendation on what maybe some of the other combinations can be, because in my head, there's a couple that are um, fairly easy. I would actually be okay and not necessarily, and, and literally um, having less than a half an hour comments, like library and SEDCO. Those two budgets are fairly innocuous. They're not significant. Um, you know, that could be a half an hour conversation for both of those rather than two separate ones. Um, yeah, the other way you could do it I is, mean, is maybe or not take, even do it, take off some that you agreed to. Yeah. Um, 
you know, with the caveat that if we have questions, we'll, we may invite you in, mm -hmm. but not schedule them as a block of time necessarily. We can find a way to get your questions answered. If there were departments, I'll use finance as an example, if the, if the overall increase in finance was less than, pick a number, percentage, 3%, and, and all of it is related to, labor. you know, labor, do you want to meet? I, you know, maybe that's kind of a, that's a, a good way point. to do it. Yeah. But if I wanted to add a new employee, then that might be a reason to. Right. You know, so maybe that's a way of thinking it, Tom, from a planning perspective, is if there's agreement here, um, let's set that now and say that if a department has less than a 3% increase overall, unless there is significant policy change or management, or, you know, um, you know, practicum change within the department. And when I say, um, you know, I don't know what a um, significant change would be, because you can still be under 3%, but you... You're changing the scope of your services, right. you know, maybe community services, because they could stay under three percent, but yet they have a significant change in their increase in fees. I really because like giving says, you right. three some time to look at the budget document, get comfortable, and say, "All right, I'm comfortable here. You know, I, this is w really where we should focus our time." I think what I'll do then is schedule for logistic purposes. We'll schedule up blocks of time, and I'm going to ask my staff to generally be available for each of these, each of these and we'll kind of do it on the fly. You know, there'll be several weeks' notice, um, but I can't tell them right now when they'll be heard, if they'll be heard. If you can break it down into three. Sure. You can do that. So, I mean, I, I like the idea of, uh, you know, of the process reflecting where the energy is or the concern, you know, in, you know, in the public. And not not just the folks who are expert trackers, you know, expert watchdog. Mm -hmm. So I mean, you know, and, and I, we're gonna we will hear from them, and, and we know that they'll be weighing in. But you know, my I, I don't really know how to do it. But I just I'm like you know defining the problem statement, not offering a solution. But that that seems valuable to me, and we'll be able to kind of track the rolling support for the thing. Um, one other th thought I had is that. I have a little bit of an issue with sort of uh, if you're less than a certain number, you don't have to report. You know, what if there are favorabilities? What if you could do better than that? What if you, you know, uh, I don't necessarily want to institutionalize uh, that as, a, as an okay figure. So kind of looking the other way. This ties back a little bit, Tom, to what you said about value for services or efficiencies that we might be able to seek. Otherwise, we, you know, we do hopefully want people thinking about those as well. Just uh, you know, uh, coming in under the wire. All right, I'll do my best to squeeze this down yeah. to three sessions. Um, and I think the best thing would be to have my staff be flexible and nimble and get further guidance from you once you see the full budget and have a Which sense of, you down. know, here's some hot buttons. Yeah. These other ones we're okay with. And, and it may be, I think, it was Sean's suggestion. Um, it could be that, that some of them, we just have simple questions we could ask that could be, you know, mm -hmm. not necessarily fit into this block of time, but he yep. answered in different ways so we get the information. Good. All right. I appreciate that feedback. Yeah. So, so I did want to address one part, though, to respond to you, Don. Um, so just from a personal perspective, um, I don't disagree with that kind of um, approach uh, as far as objecting to the less than 3%. And then looking at other efficiencies, the issue that I have is that if we're going to do that, it needs to be initiated so that it is impacted or as part of the budgetary process, not in the current year, yeah. because you're going to have budgetary or operational shock if you do that, because you're literally you're six months away yeah. from the end of the year in which that budget starts. If you're going to go in and say, okay, now you need to change your entire scope of services to be able to meet an efficiency, you really shouldn't do that in a six-month period. Don't disagree with doing it, but maybe you do it in the second because you need to prep up. You need to build the right structure within the department as far as staffing as well as any other changes. And so it's, it's, you know, proper planning produces, you know, better results. Um, so don't disagree with That's you. That's a fair From point. A, it's, yeah. it's just that when you're in the current budget cycle, yeah. it's you're thinking about six months out. Because yeah. that's when the budget starts. Absolutely. I mean, the, the goal here is to put a budget together. Yeah. The, their efficiency. You want to do that so for the forth. following year. Let's start talking about it and get Tom prepared for next yeah. year. Yeah. And say, um, you know, let's take it from that perspective. Yeah. So. Which, which I think we did a little bit of. And, yeah. Uh, and focusing on how we're going to determine which services. Well, especially at the same time that we're talking about these changes to policy or the implementation of policy initiatives that are going to eat up 
um, the things that we have now to then to on top of that ask for. Um, it's, maybe it's part of that forecasting and longer term kind of perspective. So Fair point. good, yeah. Um, financial statements moving. So if, if we can, Tom, by the 23rd, we'll have a, because I'd like to, um, at the, no, obviously not this upcoming meeting of the council, but we should have this published as soon as possible for everyone to see. Um, and um, other than we're going to be reviewing the June 30th, I, I asked Tom to include this, not to have a complete analysis, but it was really to acclimate um, Don. I mean, I know that you've probably seen these as part of being the citizen group, but just to um, kind of you know get a high level executive review from from Ruth and Tom about the um, you know financial statement um, presentation. Um, so I did ask for the June 30th, 2018, rather than an interim one. Um, that way, you know, it's basically it's already generally accepted what was written and presented. Um, and just kind of want to, if you can, if I can turn it over to Tom and Ruth to kind of maybe give us an overview of how it's present, how you present financial statements to us. Yeah, I'll, I'll just start. This yeah. is a work in progress. Uh, yeah. We want to report, provide financial information to you that makes sense in a format that makes sense to you. And Sean and Peter, you've lived with this for four or five years now, both of you. And um, we're amenable to changing this once again. So this is in large part has been shaped by um, Peter and Sean's opinion and input through the through the years. Um, so essentially, Ruth and Gina take um, an opportunity to give kind of a narrative overview, kind of report on the highlights as they see them. And I might suggest that um, what they comment on, at least they think, are important and things that you should be aware of. And then it gets into uh, some fairly detailed uh, financial statements. I'll let Ruth speak to those. Again, I don't think we need to go through them the details uh, of each, no, just and, what and they represent. It was my understanding that this was just to provide like a form yeah. because I think we actually created these way back in September, so these numbers probably have significantly changed since since that point in time. So um, what we usually do is uh, we, we're doing like a balance sheet which shows the assets and liabilities at that point in time, and then we compare it to the prior year. Uh, the second page... So if you looked on that balance sheet one, it shows June 30th is unaudited and June 2017 is audited. audited. Um, the second page shows expenditures, and we broke them out by departments. In the audit, we break them out by, well, kind of in the same format, I guess. Uh, so we can continue to do that if you like. We can combine them so that you just see uh, general government, if you will, and public safety and public service, public works, or we can continue with this detail. And again, uh, we compare current year to the prior year. And then we also have the school included in that because they're part of our general fund. Yep. With some little notes that provide a little bit more detail regarding the what might be causing some of these variances between years. The third page is the <clears throat> same format, only it's int uh, it's uh, revenues. And this does follow what we have in our audit. Again, school is listed separately. And we put a little bit of information in there about the tax rate and uh, how we're doing for collections and things so people can see where we are at any point in time. Hey, Ruth, on that uh, collections, I noticed the schools are... Is that Typical for them to be that high, you know, the high collections. Say that again. Is this, what's typical for collections? I mean, how do we? A twelve-month collection, we should be at one hundred percent. But we're usually we're usually between ninety-eight and a half and ninety-nine. By the second year, we'll be in the high ninety-nines. So right. our collections are actually pretty good. It's a pretty consistent historical. <coughs> mm -hmm. kind of it's like been consistent. Thing. Yeah. It's one of the things that uh, the bond rating agencies really like. It's it's one of the pieces they almost always comment on that our collection rate is one of the highest and consistently high. Uh, apparently that's not always the case in other communities. And so that gives them confidence that um, and we should have confidence that our tax dollars will be here when we need them. So if you look off to the right, there shows the 17 taxes, and it's a, in June of 2017, current year taxes were at 99.14%, and those 2017 unpaid taxes at June 30th, a year later, are now at 99.68%. So um, each year they, they get better. Thank you. Page 
four, uh, municipal government runs based on something called fund accounting. And so we have separate funds for different types of things that go on. So these are, these are the other funds within the town's organization. And hopefully between all those first four pages, it kind of gives an overall total picture of the town. We do revenues and expenditures, school and town. And then the next page is, is a breakdown of the school, just the school's information, because they have a, they're like a big department with a bunch of divisions, if you will. So this provides a little bit of breakdown of what those, of what they're spending their monies on. And then the very last page just shows some selected revenues that we, that are pretty big revenues for us just to see how they're trending and how they're doing. And then the bottom section takes those revenues that we break out by categories and, and breaks them out by department. And you do this quarterly. Yeah. Excise tax collections has been a juggernaut for what? Our savior for it. It really has. It is, continues oh, to exactly. outperform not just budget, but year over year over year. Yeah. It's it's remarkable. Um, and, and the state keeps trying to take that money from us. Oh, there's, there's a bill before them now to do the same to thing. To take excise? Yes. All of them? Yes. All of them? I believe so. What's the rationale? Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> it, hasn't been, it hasn't been discussed yet. <laughs> wow. So I just know that there's a bill submitted along that line. Estimated there are going to be 3,000 bills submitted, more than double than what's normal. That's one of them, along with all kinds of other stuff. Sure. Um, so on the financial statements, I just wanted to note uh, that we said, so we do receive these on a quarterly basis, um, along with what the one piece that's not included is the benchmark dashboard or the dashboard that we have, we're gonna start, we're which we're going to start having. That deals with more global. There's five measures that are more global. I think you're aware of that. Um, yes, sir. Well, two things. One, actually, as you talked about the dashboard, yeah. you know, maybe then, you know, I think we had talked about maybe trying to get the 2018 dashboard as the baseline. Yep. So I don't know when that might be yeah. available to. As soon as the audit's done, as soon as the audit's done. It's any day now. So we'll, we'll, with that uh, updated capper, we'll be able to plug in all those numbers and produce yep. quickly a, a dashboard with real life numbers. So that'd be great as kind of a yep. dashboard. So, um, and actually I have that under, um, I wrote it down. So with the audit, so once the, there's a, uh, there is something by charter that is very tight. As soon as we do receive the um, audit, we need to schedule a joint meeting with the school board, the full council and the school board to review the audit outcome. If we could have the dashboard ready, maybe if we could see it in advance, but if, um, you know, we should see the, even the audit in advance, at least for review purposes. Um, but if that could be part of the presentation for the joint session. Sure. Um, I think that would be important. Yeah, I think we can produce that updated dashboard very quickly just yeah. with the updated numbers. So uh, I'm sure we can have that available. I'll work with Chairman Hayes to schedule that when, yeah. when everyone's time permits. Um, on the uh, future meetings, I think, I hope I sent you guys this email. I think I did. So um, when Colette and I were working to uh, try to schedule um, this Monday, whatever, I don't even know what Monday this is in the month right now, but um, we could not get, um, we got lucky tonight because we're using the other half of the planning board, but it could not, I could not do that every month. Yeah. So um, I had requested if we could move our regular meeting to the fourth Wednesday of the month at 530, that would mean that our next meeting would be January 23rd, yeah. um, you know, from 530 to 730. Um, it would be here in Chambers. Mm -hmm. um, that way it's also televised rather I'm sorry. <laughs> it's all scheduled. What so. she's saying is don't change. Don't change. Yeah. <laughs> I have learned do not change the schedule on Colette. My, my hands have ruler marks on it. <laughs> Sister Mary Colette. Um, anything regarding future meeting dates or times? And then last, I, um, I, did, I forgot to include it here. Um, one of the things that I practiced when I was chair the last time was that I also like keeping a list of future kind of items yeah. that we want to put into our kind of horoscope um, and uh, kind of put out there so that once we achieve other issues and we can add the next item. Um, wanted to ask you, I know Don, you had sent out a, um, an email. I forgot to bring it. Um, what items would we like to include? 
I, I would like to keep them to, like at least maybe to keep them to three, and then as one comes off, we can always add another one, whatever it might be, um, whether it's policy driven or if it's practice procedure, uh, what some of those might be, so that we can kind of include that in, in preference of priority. Um, I would I, I personally don't have any. Um, you know, well, if you want to one I think ones? Tom had touched on was on your testing memory here, because it's a little thing, but. Um, uh, it had to do with the uh, value of services, you know, how highly valued are they? Uh, so we have, you know, some guidance. Uh, I know in the past, Thomas said it's, it's schools, garbage, and uh, dogs. So I don't know, you know. Not necessarily that order. <laughs> <laughs> I just put dogs at first. <laughs> so, so, you know, some, something like that. And I know, again, it's not a budgeting uh, Are you yeah. talking about the attitudinal survey that mm. looking at services? Mm. What services you do they on want? That. Yeah, that but it's a, something that would be uh, also sort of a cost and you know efficiency effectiveness survey. So you know the value is one part of it, but also sort of you know how how efficient are we in you know in that's the benchmark piece, yeah. the comparative yeah. analysis. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so that was that Pete was one pension uh, funding. The other was, I think we had talked about trying to set some, and this is along the lines of the uh, the roadmaps and some of the higher level uh, uh, executive tracking uh, metrics and techniques we're using. But that would be, you know, what, uh, and I remember Bill Donovan talking about some guidelines that he used for setting, you know, what the average increases should be held to. but. What should you know? Can we set a metric and, and going forward in terms of what we would want our uh, uh, fund balance to be, or what we would want our you know our debt percentage to be? Um, so, if I can, um, so in essence, uh, between pension funding and then what you just mentioned, that's really another review of the debt manage or the. Um, Policy? Fiscal policy, because they are all components with. They should be all components within our fiscal policy, okay. right? So we already have metrics on a number of things. Right. Uh, yeah. Right. yeah. I, I can tell you that the pension funding is not included in that no, fiscal no, no. policy. So no, that'd no, be no, that'd be new, uh, which is definitely worthwhile. But as far as the um, tax, not tax. Well, actually, there is no statement within the policy around tax rate. There is about debt, debt level, debt as a percentage of. Yeah. Certain things, I, you know, um, not necessarily what we have in our benchmarks or in our dashboard, but um, those items. So let's let's haul out the, let's haul out the debt policy and see where we can add to it. I mean, understanding that funding, uh, pension funding, probably could be the first one that we looked at, since it ties into the equipment and the capital and. Yeah, Donna, um, I, might, I might suggest let's uh, update the uh, the dashboard right document yeah. that we've developed, yeah. and then you'll be able to see there's. Yeah. There's I think, five or six different areas that we Great. have uh, Great. benchmarks we've Great. established for ourselves. There's not necessarily consequence, but, but there's kind of indicators. If we're above a certain level, then we should be talking in more detail. And I found my precise wording, which is a lot better than the one I just jumbled through. <laughs> oh, was so, so, we had to say, yeah. Because <laughs> so, well, no, you know, actually, we talked about as part of the uh, dashboard is did we want to make policy yeah. statements that supported each one yeah. of the benchmarks, yeah. which would, if we did, then they would be included in the fiscal yeah. policy. So those were target for debt percentage in the budget as well as a schedule and timetable yeah. to retire debt, is how I had phrased it. And the second was uh, an approach to some baseline analysis of value and costs slash efficiency and effectiveness of services. So it was a... That'd be an interesting um, yeah, conversation. Moment. How do you determine if community services is efficient or effective? Uh, uh, Police uh, can. Um, yeah. Community services. Uh, I don't know. Right. Uh, I'm. I'm. And we'll I. Talk when I'm talking about the big category <laughs> community services, yeah. not. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Todd's area. Yeah. Exclusively. So, I don't know. So an interesting analysis, benchmarking to other yeah. communities, cost per capita, yeah. and so so on and so forth, can can be indicators. Not. I think, I think uh, I, but thanks for thank you for asking. Yeah, yeah. and I appreciate the chance to clarify. I don't think I have it in front of me, but I think I sent you a couple too. And one is, you know, rather as we enter the budget season, to have some discussion at this table is how do we want to handle the revaluation 
So for instance, if we have, I mean, last year, if we have a, a goal of a 3% overall tax rate, is that before the reval gets, so how are we gonna set that framework about, so it's, uh, I think we just need to be clear and communicate how are we going to, if we say a 3% tax rate, does that include 3% with all of the revaluation yep. in there or do we, so I think we just need to get clear and be able to articulate that because that will, yep. that cause some confusion. So, um, I won't put it under future because um, that really is about what we're doing in this year's budget process. Yeah. Yeah. So we just need to um, post our footnote that so that we have that conversation as part of the overall budget. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that may come through your team building. The council's going to go through some sort of goal yes. process. So be very clear in terms of what your expectations are and how, it, how it's how being measured. The other thing I think which kind of echoes a little bit what Don said is the other thing which we're starting the process is I think we wanted to get a little further down the road to try to identify those periods of time where we can make investments. So if, if we're thinking about primary schools, you know, I think we'd looked at where the debt service changes and where there's an opportunity, some of this modeling would do it, but really is how do we do a strategic look at, at when are there pockets of time that we could take on some of these capital investments we're talking, and I think that was part of the work that is ongoing. It mm -hmm. helps inform the future. Um, and then the only question I had for us as a group, and I just use this, this just reminded me as this document we got done, it talks about, you know, they try to identify what are the positive trends, they tend to identify what, what some of the negative trends are. And just in this one example, there's, you know, last year we had some issues going on with the legal budget that was, that was over budget. And I don't know, Sean, what process, and I, it was my watch, so I, so I didn't do a good job of this, but at what point when we're going to be off budget by a significant amount, when should the finance committee talk about it? When do we need to go back to our, our you know, the rest of the counselors? When do we sort of have that, that conversation, or when do we, and Tom, you've been really good about mm -hmm. sharing when, you know, salt's going to be more expensive this year because whatever. Um, but just, you know, what sort of our, it doesn't have yep. to be solved here, but it's just a discussion about when do we want to kind of be aware of things that are going to likely to go over budget and why and make a decision whether that's where we want to be. So Actually, I think that's a good conversation because understanding how charter prescribes responsibilities for budgeting, mm -hmm. because it's very clear that the manager is the chief administrative officer and he has authority to transfer between budgets, individual departments to be able to meet the needs so long as he doesn't go over his total budget and doesn't incur any new expense. Any new expense that wasn't previously budgeted has to be approved by us. However, if he needs to take 50,000 bucks out of paper and pencils and put it into salt, then my understanding of charter is that he can't. Uh, I try to stay within departments though. Right. So if right. the salt budget's up, public works has to tighten their belt somewhere else. So that yeah. their bottom line of public works stays within the budget yeah. authorization. Um, yeah. There's a process yeah. to get a, a budget amendment Thankfully, I have never had to do that, and department heads really do a great job of managing so, so, And I might be overstating between, so I think understanding that mm -hmm. um, is very important as part of an intro to the discussion about, you know, kind of like on an ongoing basis, so it becomes not just Tom's practice, but should the day ever come that Tom is not our manager, then the next manager has that same direction, and we're not trying to rebuild that policy. Yeah, I mean, I think... You know, I, I understand the charter conversation, yeah. but but I think still, as, as an involved finance committee, I think our peers on the town council are looking to us just kind yeah. of monitor what's going on. Absolutely. So even though it's not necessarily a requirement, I'm, I'm just asking, is it good practice that if we're going to have a significant oh. variation in something that it's just, we either can say that's great, no, no problem, or it gives at least an opportunity for us to say, whoa, wait a minute, we need to... Whatever. I mean, I, I don't know what the answer is, but I'm just suggesting that when we see oh, these, these negative things, what do we yeah. want to do about it? And, so. and, and all I'm suggesting is that to me, charter is always the baseline. Yeah. But you then add on top of that for management practices and best practices is always better for the community. So, you know, I think it's just understanding what that is. Um, the other piece I wanted to add, although um, I don't know if we're going to have time to get it all done in the year. Um, but I think there's an expectation from our colleagues regarding the conversation around TIFs and CEAs and whether or not we need a policy that addresses after the, um, the last uh, TIF and CEA that we agreed to. I think that it was brought up about whether or not we were going to have a policy discussion here. 
and what are we going to initiate as part of that. So I'll at least put it on the cap on the list. Yep. Um, I can, I can I report Councillor Donovan, uh, Chairman of the Rules and Policies Committee, brought that up, yep. and that group it directed me to at least um, start to collect other TIF policies. So I think they're prepared to put some effort toward that. Yep. There was conversation whether uh, finance needed to be involved, and I said uh, I think they're I know they're interested. Um, so. Yeah, so um, some coordination. I don't want to duplicate effort. No, and so I think that um, so the, the, I had a conversation with Bill about this, um, and after thinking about it, I, I believe it really needs to be in finance because the rules and policies committee is about the rules, the section of the ordinance that talks about council's rules and policies, and this is a fiscal CEA and TIFs is a fiscal policy. It is not a rules and policy about the conduct of the council. Um, I, and so I, unless uh, we reviewed their mandate yes it does look at the at the council's policy for and rules and procedures for itself but it also is authorized to look at other town policies and so that under that broad mandate it came up at the yeah. committee meeting I think they're pleased to pass it off they just feel equally I, interested yeah, in just, advancing the, the so notion I would counter and say that means that the debt management policy that we create should go to the rules and policies <laughs> so I, I mean I'm not trying to Situation. Yeah, I, I'm just saying is that the good news is duplicate effort. The, the good news is there seems to be universal interest yeah. in the matter that we yeah. should advance something. Yeah. So, um, so but so we'll at least put it. I'll put it on yeah. the, 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 the horoscope. I mean, I just to add color. I did. I did have a conversation with Paul on the way here, who talked about that, and I said, you know, part, I think it does need to go through finance at some point. So whether they take the first step, whatever. So I, yeah. think, I think it's a great conversation to have. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, maybe it's a combined effort. Let them, because yeah. you've got, you're going to get real busy real soon. Uh, let them do some of the formative work and report kind of big picture, perhaps. Um, spread the well, load. Maybe I've got enough things to do. <laughs> I mean, ultimately, the it, full council needs to adopt it. So yeah. it, it, uh, it's going to be we'll get full vetting. But I agree with Sean. It does, it does need to touch finance before. Okay. It's on the list. Well, because one, of, and by the way, uh, one of the big pieces that I would really want to have bond council's opinion yeah. on that policy, which goes directly to the credit rating, yeah. the whole issue around the town's credit rating and as part of the overall policy, mm -hmm. yeah. let alone any legal considerations. So, all right. Um, anything else under future meetings, topics? Is that good? Thanks. Great. Thank you. Um, public comment? Mr. Hanley, any comment? Happy Ms. New Year. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Colette, anything from a distinguished yes. record keeper? Um, my question to you is, we gave you the schedule. That was a draft schedule for those four days. If you notice, you're not available on Tuesday since, I, since we did this. We just did an example from last yes. year. So I want to make sure that we're looking at days of the week that everybody's built. Yeah. So these are Tuesdays, so what days right. do you want to? Well, yeah, I didn't even think of that. It would have to be Monday, Wednesday, or Friday. And I'm not meeting with you guys on Monday night at 6 to 8. I'm sorry, on Friday night, 6 to 8. <laughs> so Monday, Wednesday. So Monday, Wednesday. No, yeah. And, um, there may be opportunities for Tuesdays as well. It's just that the hard part is that I don't know. I don't know this far in advance because of the schedule. April, I'm assuming um, that's usually when what I've been told is when the legislature really gets up and running. So I'm pretty much blocking 6 a.m. to 8 p.m. at night because it would be May and June that it's really like I'll never be out of there. So we'll look for Mondays or Wednesdays we through can. April. And it's at least for us, it's, we've already committed to Wednesdays. So if you can look at that, whatever Wednesday that is during that one week, um, the fourth week. Conflicts with council, but uh, if it's an evening oh, meeting, okay. but, uh, well, yeah, the, but yeah. we need to schedule at least three meetings in April. But, uh, why don't we work yeah. with you directly and yeah. propose some, some dates back up to the group? Yep. Good. All right. With that, um, is there a motion to adjourn? Motion. So moved. At 6.57 p.m. All right. All in favor. It's unanimous. Thank you. Thank you, folks. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. Thank you. Thank you.